Welcome to episode 174 of Silver Lining for Learning. And when I set up this episode, I made one critical mistake. This is 1111 at noon Eastern time. I should have made this at 11 Eastern. It'd be 111111. Uh, this one show is on immersive learning, found in the fjords of Norway. We have Louise Edwards, who's the lead developer and 3D artist of Three Otters Media, and her teammate, Tiffany Dong, a writer. And they'll take us on an adventure, multiple adventures, hopefully during this show, and explain what they've been working on for the past year. Because it's almost exactly a year ago that they met and formed as a team. We didn't know this when setting up the show, so I got one thing right. I just messed up the time. Anyways, Louise and Tiff, I would really like to hear about the project or about the future projects you plan to work on, about your backgrounds. Um, tell us a little bit about yourselves before we get into what you've been working on. Um, maybe we start with Louise, because uh, you're the one I contacted first and we found online, and then we'll go to, to Tiff. And then we'll start the conversation about the project found in the fjords and other things. So go ahead, Louise. Hi, it's really good to be here. Thanks for having us on. Um, so uh, where to start and not to take up the entire hour just <laughs> talking about my <laughs> weird background. So I am a um, lapsed earth scientist uh, turned um, environmental professional turned um, high school science teacher um, and the, then found VR development as a way to kind of put all of those things together. Uh, so back many, many years ago when I was a, a teenager, I became obsessed with volcanoes and um, decided that I had to devote my life to understanding them and watching them erupt and um, doing sciencey things on them and 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 also working with communities on kind of this complex like risk assessment and communication and all of these these things that um, go around like how do you live and coexist with um, natural disaster things um, and that kind of took me on a path towards. Um, uh, a degree in science and a PhD in um, uh, igneous geochemistry at University of Melbourne. <laughs> um, and um, but um, and just a love. Uh, and that's kind of where my love of education kind of started to develop, develop, although I'm the child of two teachers. So it had been instilled in me from a very young age that I should never, ever, 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 ever become a teacher. Um, in fact, there were threats of disownment. Um, but anyway, so uh, I, I, um, as many of the people on here who have gone through further academic education, it's a bit of a thing. And by the end of my um, my PhD, I was pretty broken by the whole experience and ready to leave. So I had met my husband, moved to Canada, and um, ended up in the private sector with this PhD that I didn't really know what to do with. And, and after a while and several existential crises, um, decided to go back to school to become a, a an educator, um, high school science, just a way, really, I, I like, this sounds super cynical, but I kind of wanted to indoctrinate the youth. <laughs> um, and, um, just really get them thinking about, about science in a different way. As, as less than a series of facts and more about a way of engaging with the with the world um and um and teenagers are hilarious so I kind of wanted to hang out with them a little bit um and yeah so I went back to school became a high school teacher um and about that time my husband was getting super into VR um and um he had bought like kind of an early early version of modern vr back in 2016 and htc vive and he put me in this headset and i was just blown away like it was just wow you feel so thoroughly immersed in this place and um i as I, when i kind of went into the classroom after that all i could see were opportunities and as an earth scientist by training in the classroom one of the thing that really kind of got really kind of was very obvious was that most science teachers 
I really don't have the background in earth and environmental science to teach it conf confidently and competently and engagingly. And also a lot of the textbooks are wrong. Um, and as I, there's a huge opportunity here to marry these two way, new ways of learning through VR and immersive experiences where you can take people to inside of a volcano, for example, and help supporting teachers to kind of deal with some, to meet some of these curriculum targets that they, the way they were really struggling with. While also on top of that, using this incredible like interdisciplinary science to really teach people and really help get people familiar with, you know, the gray and the messy of doing science and looking at how science is done and using that to kind of engage with the world and make decisions. So fast forward a little bit, I moved again, couldn't find a job as a teacher because of the political situation in our province here in Canada and, um, and pandemic -y things kind of gave me the opportunity to start learning how to develop in VR and um, really just fell in love with all of the ways that it could, the, that it, the, the power that it could offer learners um, when also the what it offered me as someone who had always been searching for something that offered me the science, the creativity, the social and the technical. Um, and then, yeah, fast forward a little bit, found this, put together this awesome little team and we're kind of trying to figure out how we can translate these experiences that we're having about the planet in the uh, being able to visit these incredible places and how to make those experiences and the impact they have through awe and wonder more accessible to more people without the destruction of going there. Thanks, Louise. And that's the first time I think I've heard a PhD pursuit being called a bit of a thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've, got, we've all got a bit of a thing then, you know, <laughs> it, it's a good thing going on. Um, you know, and in your pursuit of volcanoes, we are all could, 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 you know, we all had our pursuits early on. Mine was Egyptian pyramids, which I finally got to see a month ago uh, and other things. So, yeah, I'm sure Tiff has had her share of things that she's wanted to pursue and, and been able to do them as part of your team. You know, the three otters media. Tiff, you want to describe how you guys met and, and a bit of your background first and then get, take us into uh, the one year ago meeting and, and what that's what that entailed and what you're doing. I would be thrilled to, Kurt. So. My name's Tiff. I um, am a corporate lawyer by training. I did renewable energy project finance in Los Angeles, and I was super miserable. And I went I'm on- I'm a former accountant, and I was super miserable in that yes. too. You know, so. I'm very <laughs> proudly an ex-lawyer. Like I earned that ex, and it was, it was hard, and I proudly, proudly wear it. So I went on this dive trip. Um, my first international scuba diving trip to the Galapagos. And I found myself on the bow of the boat at 3 a.m. crying and just like feeling so alive and so in awe of this place that I'd never been. And I, I, I describe it like I felt like I was home, even though I'd never visited this place before, even though I'd just left LA, which was my home. And it really shook me to my core. And I, I didn't try to figure it out. I just let the week, you know, pass through just diving, sleeping outside on the deck under the stars, just really feeling the immensity of that place. And like, I mean, the Galapagos are such an incredible, like special place to, to feel these things. And when I got back, I almost didn't get back on the plane when I finally was like, okay, we can't just, you know, get back on the boat and do this forever. When I got back on the plane and I landed in LA, I was sitting in my seat and I, I didn't get up when the, the ding called and when everyone started shuffling and I was just like, okay, you will not get out of the seat unless you promise that nothing will be the same. And so I did, I made that vow to myself. And a month later I quit my job. I eventually sold my house in LA and I have been exploring and campaigning for our oceans ever since. And in that pursuit I have done just about any weird, funny, amazing, and awesome job you can do for the oceans, which includes wearing a shark, a human-sized shark suit and protesting unsustainable seafood outside of Whole Foods and other restaurants. It includes, you know, going on a covert 
um, expedition to showcase like illegal fishing where they were killing dolphins and sharks when they were supposedly just fishing for shark fish, uh, swordfish. It includes becoming a scientific diver and doing coral restoration work in the Florida Keys. And now my main endeavor is I accompany scientists like Lou and like other people um, in their work while scuba diving. And then I get to write about it for newspapers and magazines. So I do a lot of science communication and the focus is kind of sharing for the broader world the impact that these brilliant minds are having with that largely, you know, exists only in journals or within their academic circles. And I think that's such a loss to the rest of us. So I act as a translator through diving and through writing of the just amazing work being done. So that, can I jump, yeah. sorry, can I jump in here quickly? I, I, it's something that I, I was not expecting to talk about, but uh, both of you sort of alluded to that. And I really, want to emphasize that. So Tiff, I think you spoke to it more, most eloquently about that moment where you were on the boat, you know, near the Galapagos and that that sense of awe and and just, it's just the, the grandeur of the whole, whole moment and the connection, deep connection to yourself in some way. And I know uh, one of the things that I feel like, and, and Louise, you can speak to this as well, in terms of how we talk about science in school, uh, which is so devoid of that that sense feeling. of yeah. feeling of awe of you know that that we are I mean I just read this this morning somewhere that you know that that we are the same material as sand and and air and here we are talking to each other I mean you know that 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 that, that, that most of a tree is made up of air like just that you know that that material doesn't come from the soil actually is air I mean things like that which really move you and I think that some of that sense of awe and sort of this aesthetic response to science is something we have completely lost in in schools so before we get into sort of the AR VR piece of it I would love to hear sort of your thoughts on like how one can possibly bring that back and what value it has had for you and maybe Louise how you try to sort of bring it into the teaching or both of you into the communication and teaching that you do. Anybody can jump in. Yeah, like I, and and you've just taught, you've just really picked up on like, really, I think our key motivation here, like our key driving force. And I know you said we'll leave the VR till later, but it's such a key part of kind of why we've chosen to do that. And I mean, I'm I'm super lucky. I live in the Rocky Mountains of Canada. I get awe and wonder every day. And I, if in in terms of like what it does to you physiologically and psychologically, in terms of be, the readiness to learn, I think it's really easy to forget that learning is an emotional thing. Like, and, and we often forget that and we have to be in that space to to not just to be able to learn, but to want to learn. And um, I think for both of us, we have been lucky enough throughout our lives to experience the power of the awe and wonder of this planet from the absolutely minute to the to the biggest scales. And that has really had a profound impact on us, our relationship with the planet and the choices we make. And um, I remember, yeah, the first time I saw a volcano erupt, like I cried, like I full on cried. And um, and and it wasn't because I was that scared. <laughs> it, was just, <laughs> it wasn't the fear response. It was just like that overwhelming. And I think really what we're trying to do here, and I think really that meeting of, because I'm not sure if it was a meeting of the minds. It was a meeting of the souls when we all came together. And I, that is such a significant part of it is, is how we have been influenced by the planet and our experiences in there and how that, how we want to use that to, to, to have that influence back, you know. Thank you, Tiff. Tiff? Yeah, on that same note, I think, you know, we as a as a society, we have learned to trauma bond and, and things. But as Louise alluded to, I think we joy bonded our group. You know, we share this immense, amazing experience that most people don't get to have alone. And we did it together with these people that we 
didn't know existed. And we were, we were, go, we were eye to eye with Orca and we were watching, you know, baby humpbacks learn how to like breathe and take their, their tails up and down. And we were with these massive mountains and, you know, permanently orange skies from Arctic winter. It was what I like to say about these experiences is that it reminds me how insignificant we are, how insignificant I am in the best ways. Right. I, I think our culture, especially work culture um, and school culture teaches us that like we are primary and we're so important and like keep driving towards bigger, better, more success. But it's incredible to go to a place that makes you feel entirely unimportant and to recognize the grandeur that has existed forever before you and that will exist well after you. And I think that's the magic of, you know, nature and of, and when you can connect that, like you were saying, Punya, to science, to help people not just look at it and be in visual awe, but to be like, you are, like you said, this, this sand is you, this air is you. When you can connect someone that deeply, they will be forever changed. And I think that's a critical I think that's that is a critical thing that we've lost. Like I know for myself personally, I shied away from the sciences, even though I'm absolutely intrigued by them because I didn't have a model in my life of someone doing science. No one in my family really is a scientist and it felt really dry. And so, you know, I proceeded on my little path and I think by pursuing and by developing new ways of connecting to people it, that you know, sneak in the education, sneak in the science within this bubble of massive joy and awe. I think we can help like new generations of people and not just young, like people like me connect to these places in ways that they never knew were possible. And to jump back into kind of one of your questions, like in the classroom, like for me, that was getting kids outside, right? Like, and to see the landscape, um, and we were lucky, like I saw it in a school which was made out of this incredible limestone that was just like chocker with fossils, right? Like just so many. And just sending them outside to kind of make that connection with the now, the past, the present, and and looking around the place that they were li- that they live that's home and like what all of these things mean to them in their life. Like that's that's how I did. Like VR just gives you another way of transporting you to these other places as well to get that connection but people are already connected to place in and and if we can kind of kind of connect what we're doing to that those connections that already exist like that's that's kind of how I try to go about it so you always take your students on a field trip down here to Indiana it says Bloomington Indiana and Bedford are is the home of Yankee Stadium the Empire State Building the Pentagon and many other places on the east coast when the Pentagon was hit they had to quarry that those mines and and bring new limestone to dc um so yeah i also comment tiff um we've had two shows in year one about the oceans one in particular we had cassandra brooks who i feature in one of my books um talk about the last ocean project and she studies the antarctic toothfish and the krill down in Antarctica and other things. Now she's a professor in Denver, University of Colorado, in, in Boulder, University of Colorado. We also had Jean Pennycook on talking about the Adali penguin and sending the, her research and studies off to hundreds of schools around the world and corresponding with kids, creating curriculum around her studies of penguins. So we've had a couple of shows that you might be interested in watching. Maybe after this show, I'll send you a link to both of those. But also for those loyal listeners um, or viewers, uh, you might be thinking about, well, how we can connect this show to to other shows in Silver Lining for Learning. So those are two shows that you might want to have your students look at all three. I was remiss in not introducing the co-host here. We have Yang Zhao, who's currently in New Zealand this more early morning for him in New Zealand. Uh, Thank you, Yang, for, for, for being here. He's a professor at the University of Kansas and the University of Melbourne. We have Punya Mishra, who's with us here from Arizona State University, and Chris Didi from Harvard University, who has the next question. Chris. So I want to build on what Kurt said about prior shows, because we have had a history over Silver Lining for Learning about shows that celebrate both science and the natural environment. And uh, we have at least one show that uses VR to do this, 
And the second year, Jeremy Balenson and his team came in and talked about their ocean acidification project. And they've done a lot of studies with how you can use VR to get people involved. And I've, I've been working with VR for more than three decades and come out of a science background. So I'm certainly resonating to a lot of what you're saying. But I think it's important to recognize that VR is not magic. Um, and that in fact, if somebody's disinterested in science or could care less about the natural environment other than looking for a good place to put up more condos, um, that being in a VR headset doesn't automatically um, change that. Uh, one of my doctoral students who just graduated, Eileen McGivney, did her um, doctoral dissertation on uh, using VR experiences in high school to teach science and, um, you know, had both a lot of success, but also came up against the fact that it's, it's, there's no single best way to do anything, including VR. So I think, I think one of the puzzles is that there are people like, like you and like me and, and probably the rest of my co-hosts who, when you put on the, the headset and you're at an awe-inspiring place, you're, you're inspired. Uh, but I think um, for many people, it takes more. It takes a narrative of some kind um, because people are engaged by storytelling. It takes um, a surmountable danger because you can just be filled with despair if you see what's happening, but you don't see a route forward. And one of my colleagues here at Harvard, Professor Tina Grotzer, is doing studies on uh, how you teach environmental science in a way that provides hope. Because we can't, you know, we we can't give up just because it's a dark time. So I'm I'm curious as to as you think about um, the ways in which you use VR with surrounded with supports of different kinds, so that you can uh, reach the audience and and articulate the science. I'd love to hear about some of the strategies that you're using or thinking about. Yeah, so I'll I'll start that, and then I'm going to pass it over to Tiff because she's our you know storyteller extraordinaire, and uh, just to say like absolutely like all of those things that you said are things that we have considered and are continuing to try and work out the best way of incorporating. Um, and I I love that you kind of brought up this like VR like nothing. It's not a magic bullet, and I think everybody in education has suffered enough from ed tech being led by the tech and not so much by the ed and um um and not every vr is not the solution to everything and badly designed vr is not going to to help so when we kind of came came at this and i certainly do not think we've done a perfect job because we're still learning how to to do this um but we've had these things in the in the back of our mind so as you said like storytelling narrative structure like was really important to us and tiff is just incredible like i she had never written anything in like done any kind of non-linear storytelling before and i think that's some of the power of not just vr but game-based learning is kind of how you can do some non-linear explorative narrative and she'd never done any of this before and i just I emailed her, like sent her a few kind of excerpts and videos just to kind of give her an idea of what was out there. And within 24 hours, she had this like incredible storyboard of like how to <laughs> kind of share these experiences in this really cohesive and impactful way. And then like, again, like transfer of learning was super help, super important to us as well as, as you, do you notice, as you mentioned, like sending people off with hope and not just like, you know, sending them into nihilistic despair. So um, having that call to action, that way to translate this experience from inside the headset to outside the headset into their daily life was really, really important. And, and that's why we have at the end of this experience, 
um, kind of some calls to action and some opportunities to stay engaged and some some pro ocean actions that you can take as you go forward. Um, and we can kind of explain those more, but I really want to pass on to Tiff to really talk about her process because it's just been really, for me, just really wonderful having her kind of take the helm of that storytelling. Thanks, Lou. Um, yes, absolutely agree with everything that Chris and Lou just said. Uh, for me, m- prior to this experience, all of my storytelling um, work has been like in a physical newspaper, a physical magazine, or digitized versions of those. So it was very different to to have a player be my audience, be a, a part of building something, co-creating, right? It's a totally different experience. And it was so fun for me to experiment with that. Um, the main way I can kind of describe how VR has helped me um, change my storytelling is we've all seen that like the David Attenborough documentaries about, you know, like even um, the most amazing ones, there's, there's planet, uh, there's secrets of the whales, right. Which is new. And it, it follows all these different orca populations around the world. And it tells you about their cultures and there's um, Brian scary, incredible videographer, storyteller filming it and telling you his his interaction, like an orca welcomed him into its pod by giving him food. And you're like, wow, this is the best documentary I've ever seen. And when I was writing this story, I could not get out of my mind an experience that our third otter, our third teammate had, where I uh, came eye to eye with a large male orca. And she kind of was just like, hmm, and tilted her head and the orca mirrored her. And then when she tilted the other way, it mirrored. And that is a interspecies connection that you can't write you can't make up right that is it happened in the wild and it was spur of the moment and she came back up crying and forever changed and I was like oh my gosh I didn't have my contact lenses and I didn't see it I like what am I doing but I couldn't forget that connection that she had had and and I saw firsthand how it affected her because I was right next to her and so I decided in our game I'm not going to make it like a documentary where, you know, you're the person following the orca. Let's flip it. Let's become the orca because you can't do that in a regular documentary. You can't do that in a regular story. But in VR, you have the chance to embody any character, anything. You know, we could be water. We could be ice. But for this experience, I chose to have us embody orca because we don't get to do that. Right. We see them as killer whales or orcas or, you know, big dolphins in like very static colors but we don't get to see what it's like to be a baby orca and learn how to eat and get frustrated that it's so hard to catch a herring or to be like, what is a big fishing ship doing in our ocean? And so I flipped traditional narratives and I decided that I wanted us to be Nora, this baby orca, learning from her mom based off of science. And we pepper in all of these facts about herring run, about climate change, about whales and orca culture and about human impacts on all of these throughout the game through and not through reading like a textbook, but you have a a game guide, which is a little jellyfish named Clara. Um, And she was actually voiced by the lead scientist on our expedition where we met. So there's just lots of beautiful personal touches. And I wanted my players, our players to really feel the Arctic the way an orca might, how we thought an orca might. And I think that's the beauty of this medium, right? It's not perfect, but it gives us an alternative that no other mediums currently present. We mentioned that, um, or Chris had mentioned that he's been involved in VR for some decades. And for those listeners who want to explore that, you might go to River City or Echo Learn and read about Chris's prior research and studies um, and development in the area of VR, but it's still all VR is a work in progress, as he mentioned. Um, So I'm just wondering if anyone wants to follow up with a comment or a question here. Um, There's a question from one of our uh, regular listeners, Dodsey over on the YouTube channel. So first there's a comment and a question. So the comment is, it is important to align the technology to the pedagogy and not the other way around, which I think Louis, what you talked about, not be driven by the tech, but rather the ed. But then the had a follow up question that if you had any pedagogical models that you tend to follow when using VR 
in teaching and learning? Are there any approaches that you seem to think have worked better or are some philosophies or approaches that you are bringing to it that maybe is new or different or something that way? Anybody want to jump in? I suppose as the educational education professional, I should jump in, I suppose. Um, and I like, guess interesting, like um, um I think like all of us, we take little bits from here and there to um as as we develop kind of our own um uh approaches to things. Like I I think I I look a lot at, at um yeah, games, games-based learning, and and really, I study probably more than education. I study about think that the ways that we learn outside of um, standard education. So, my husband is a massive video gamer, and um, I find it really interesting how he learns through playing games, and how interesting games um, can really inspire you to, to, to learn different things. So they, they're really good, at, super good at manipulating emotions <laughs> and putting us in that readiness to learn. Um, they're incredibly good at scaffolding learning. So you are well, like you, you go through gradual orientation and, and building additional complexity as you go through a, a, a mission. Like they have, they don't, wouldn't, they don't necessarily express this to you, but they have really well established learning goals, right? Like mission goals, right? Um, they have um, spaced repetition, paced, paced repetition, spaced repetition, right? Like one of the few things that have actually been shown to be really, really good for learning, right? Like that you can develop it, you can get in, you can try something, you can switch it off, you can save, you can come back and, and you know, develop those skills. Um, this I, choice and flexibility, those kinds of things that, you know, you can choose your own adventure to a certain, within realms, right? Like there has to be some constraints in there, constraints in there to stop the development of misconce misconception, especially in science education, like misconceptions can be really damaging. So you need to be careful of how constructivist you get. Um, um, it provides immediate and, immediate and targeted feedback um and and really exploring that like the like for example in our game like when you catch a fish like you know when you've caught a fish and you get a oh yeah well done you've caught a fish and oh you were really close but try this next time um and um there's when you add the vr onto it you get all of these other i i kind of before when I left the classroom, I went into competency-based education. Um, so that was kind of my area um, of expertise and really aligning to, really thinking about some of the things you want to achieve and authentically, the idea of authentic learning and assessment. And, and this is really in a skills-based environment. And I think my passion is, again, more abstract and philosophical perhaps and and internal than some of the career-based stuff that I was doing, but still a, a, this idea that you can be the, the the value of being able to practice in a safe place that then you can kind of trans, tr translate outside. And then when you get into VR, like that is really where it starts to shine in terms of that opportunity for authentic learning uh, practice um, and and this this sense of presence. So I get a little bit of a mishmash from lots of different places um, that combine also with I I have a lot of bias from science research, right? Like in being a scientist that also informs kind of how I go about designing designing things. So I'm not because I'm a really reasonably late stage ed educator. I'm not sure I have like the theoretical pedagogical independence that I can probably give a satisfactory answer. But that's kind of the thought, some of the things that are in my mind that drive how I design. Yeah, but it's probably gives you an advantage, not being indoctrinated in early. So you be able to form your beliefs and then look back from a you know, at the pedagogy that was in place or the the approaches, the principles, and so forth. So actually, that's refreshing. Uh, thanks, Louise. Uh, before Chris asks this question, Tiff, did you want to add to that? Um, sure. So I think what I draw from as my job as a journalist is to is to present facts, but with like put them in the context of something greater, right? And I think 
with VR, uh, for me and in a lot of my writing, that something greater is what you mentioned before, Kurt, I think is hope, right? Especially in the environmental space, it's really easy to just want to throw in the towel. And a lot of what we share is scary, you know, at scary at at least. And so I really wanted to ground how we built this game in hope, which is why I ended it with the calls to action that Lou was describing earlier. And it's it's five commitments. We don't even call them choices. They're commitments that our players make at the end of the game after. So oh, so in our storyline, you're this orca, you, you learn, you eat, you play, you frolic, and then you have an experience just like Aya did and you switch, you warp into a human. And then as a human, you go back to your ship, which is actually our ship, and you make a commitment for your orca pod, for humans, and for the planet, right? And we picked on purpose choices that are mutually beneficial for all. And so it's like you're reducing your carbon footprint, eating more sustainable seafood, um, reducing plastics, things like that. And we have, you know, linked resources and all that. But I wanted players not to just be like, wow, that was fun. Or, oh, I learned about orca. I wanted them to leave with a strong sense of, where do I go from this? And I do the same kind of thing in my writing. I like to leave my readers impacted, but then where do I go from here? Like, what can I do? How can I change? How can I affect something? And so I brought that line of thinking into the storytelling as well. Chris? So one of the interesting things that immersion can do is embodiment, where you're not just surrounded by something, but actually you feel as if physically you're there inside of um, some kind of uh, a body. And it could be your body, but it could also be, as you point out, uh, the body of an animal. Uh, in EcoMod, which was the fourth of the EcoLearn curricula that my colleagues and I developed, it was for third graders and uh, a simulated ecosystem. This is through the monitor. It's not true VR. And one of the things you could do in the simulated ecosystem was to become a beaver. And as the beaver, you uh, your goal was to chop down trees and build a dam and build a beaver lodge. Uh, but there was a wolf, um, which is authentic. And <clears throat> you had to keep one eye open for the wolf and head for the water as fast as you could if the wolf got too close. And um, there were other things that you could be embodied as, as a woodpecker. And we found, um, not surprisingly, that knowledge of beavers increased because you, you were a beaver. Um, affect about beavers became more positive because, hey, it can be fun to chop down trees and, you know, evade the wolf and so on. <clears throat> but, um, it also helped because we were teaching computational modeling. And so when you want to write a program that simulates a beaver, you start to think about, well, what did I do? Well, I moved my right leg or I, you know, I started chewing or, and so you, you sort of develop a procedural representation of, of what it's about. <clears throat> now that lends itself better to some things than to others. Um, I'm not sure how to embody anybody inside of a volcano. <laughs> that seems to me like a, a tough challenge um, because fire spirits are not going to be part of a science curriculum, however, you know, fun they might be. But I'm I'm interested in in ways that you might have either experimented with embodiment or be thinking about experimenting with embodiment. Well, I think um, this this particular um, this particular experience of found in the fjords was certainly my first experience with um, um, interspecies embodiment, and I I have to say, like, I was pretty resistant to it <laughs> initially, um, and that was more from a 
I guess from a developer perspective and like, how do I get this to, how do I really make you feel like you are an orca swimming? How do I do that without you making, feeling motion sick? How do I, like, how do I really make you believe, how do we really make you believe that you are an orca? And so that was like, that might just be a bit beyond me. Um, uh, But it's been really fun to kind of, play with that and I I think one of my favorite things that you can do that make the thing in this that makes me feel most like I am an orca is as you move around you change your direction by moving your head so if you go up you'll move up and down and you can actually surf on the surface of the water as if you are um traveling and all of the so um all of the environments are actually based in this game are based on the um actual terrain data around the arctic fjord area so it it really looks kind of like we were back there but instead of being like this very useless snorkeler who can't really go very far you can be this inc- you can yeah you can surf and you can dive and you can you just imagine that you have that fluidity of motion that you would have in there so like kind of understanding and thinking like the ways in which we are the same and the ways that we are the different in in terms of like how you move but also like what visual feedback do you get like because often one of the 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 ways of doing it if it's a human you'll put yourself in front of a mirror and you get to kind of move and kind of get this reflection and so we've kind of tried to 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 do that using the undersurface of the water as a mirror so you could like like kind of when you jump into the game you kind of go and you you learn your you learn how to bite and do a tail slap and things while you can see yourself as a reflection in the in in the the underwater in the the sea surface um and kind of that's that has just that has actually been a really interesting exploration i'm i there are things i would do differently i think we in the next game because we're going to Antarctica in February it's something that we want to explore more and I think as we go down there with this in mind because this was an afterthought right like and we kind of had to think back and as an going down with that intent I think we can really observe what we see with that lens like and really think about kind of how what that experience is Um, and just to kind of talk about the volcano thing so i haven't actually done a volcano experience just yet but one of my kind of earth sciencey one is called earth uh, elevated to the center of the earth so it gets around that by imagining we are in a in a in in a, some future state where we've been able to drill a, a, an elevator shaft and you can actually experience that um and control where you are and and experience an earthquake and see what the outer core might look like and learn that a lot of the earth is green and um and and learn some of the skills and the tools that as geologists we we use um and so you're kind of thinking of ways not just about kind of embodiment but the i guess how you design that physical environment as well which which um is is kind of another way you do it, and I think like I, I'm not sure. I'm sure that Jeremy Balenson talked about on his his show about the rare, impossible, dangerous, expensive um, thing, which I I fully adhere to. I think it's great. I also add destructive onto the end of that because I think it there's a lot of opportunity to help us explore places that going there that if we actually go there, we are destructive in ourselves. Um, but trying to think about well. If it's impossible to get there, like how how do we actually put ourselves there and make it feel like we're there in a in a digital in a virtual space? So um, I haven't quite worked that out for being inside a magma chamber yet, Tris, which is probably why it doesn't exist. Or <laughs> well, someone else may have done it um, already and and kind of solved that problem, but it is an interesting one for sure. Tiffany. I think for me, embodiment, um, I try to, in my writing, I always include emotions, right? Because I think like we've discussed, like there, there's such a disconnect between feeling and science. So I always ask scientists, like, how did you feel putting that coral back on the reef? Or how did you feel seeing your life's work die because of a heat wave? Because I think we, we, we don't, you know, we say like abundance and, you know, all these very scientific terms and like the regular person wants to to hear like I sobbed in my mask like 
I, I watched 500 year old corals die before my eyes in a week. And so I think for me with the embodiment piece, I really wanted um, our players to feel something they couldn't feel as a human. Right. And so when we were, there's this um, pass where as an orca, you're swimming with your pod from one, one other and um you're chatting with your mom about and all that and that like free feeling of just something i only feel dive and I, I always put my hands out and i just like feel the water rush past me and i wanted to recreate that as much as possible so i try to just i when i'm writing embodiment um i try to think about what feelings are similar to humans but that are on a different level that we can't experience you know like because we're not orcas because we can't swim through the ocean like that fast we we are you know sad little snorkelers compared so that's that's kind of where i go in with my embodiment work we lost you a little bit in the with the internet connections here tiffany but we got most of it um so your internet must be a little unstable i think and Punya's is a little unstable as well today um, but this is a great show, and we, we do want to be inclusive, and so I know you're three otters media, so I, I, we need to at least talk a little about, about Aya and her role. Could you please, one of you, please introduce her and her full name and what she's what her role within the project, and can you explain what we talked about prior to the show and how you guys met uh, a year ago and what your mission is at Three Amigo or Three Otters Media, <laughs> Three Amigos. <laughs> um, so, um, would one of you like to do that? You go right ahead, Tiff. Sure. Um, so, I, I actually I'm gonna go right ahead, but borrow from you, Lou. Lou says that Aya is the most quiet, quietly talented human she knows in like every aspect, and it's it's true. She can do anything and everything with like flair and pizzazz and but does it so quietly and she's just incredible she wrote um all of the sound for our game which it has won an award at a film fest um she developed it based off of the real recordings of whales that we had she designed these beautiful worlds these digital worlds you know that we use everywhere she did our logo which has found in the fjords all of our letters in it she's just she can do anything and everything instantly and she's incredible and so fun and so wonderful um her name is Aya Walraven she has a ton of experience in product development game development um crypto art music like you you name it she's probably done it at some point and um I'll let Lou continue with her descriptions but I will say the moment we met, we call ourselves the three otters because there was one day after a very successful um, day of orca sightings and humpback sightings that our Zodiac driver let us just play in the water. Um, and so we were just floating in these dry suits. Imagine Michelin men, women, Michelin women, just all floating at the top of the Arctic Ocean. You know, there's sometimes there's dorsal fins coming around us and we're playing like kids and we're in full full joy you know like laughing and just doing what no one's even necessarily playing with each other but we're all in this water sandbox together having the time of our life and the sky is like sunset orange there's huge snowy peaks it's it's actual magic it's like being in this like snow globe world and we were there and then Aya just decides to lay back like an otter with her fin tips up looking at the sky to take it in and then Lou comes over, links arms with her, and it's like, I'm an otter too. And they're just laying there. And I'm watching them far back because I wanted to take in the whole scene. And I was just like, this is like, this is imprinted. This is a core memory. And because I also have FOMO, I was like, well, if you guys are otters, I also want to be an otter. Like I didn't link arms, but I'm otter three. So that's why we're the three otters because of that moment where we were just so together with each other and with the Arctic and everything. So Louise, how do people find out about you? I mean, are, is, is the game you developed something is being implemented in schools? Um, and, and do you have plans for future projects that build on it? Yeah, so um, we're trying to figure out 
like what our deployment plan is right now. I think um, we're working with some um, some people who will kind of work with museums and aquaria because so this this project came about just kind of a bit of a rewind. Um, because I found out that the UN were running a, a competition called the Metaverse for the SDGs, uh, the, sustain the Sustainable Development Goals. And the idea was build a virtual, uh, teams would build virtual environments about um, uh, around one of, of the Sustainable Development Goals. And um, I really want, I was encouraged by um, some uh, people I know in the industry to to submit some of my earlier work but um, none of it really aligned to a particular sustainable development goal. So I, um, I was like, mm -hmm. so I, was, I then this opportunity came up to go and play and snorkel with Orca in in Norway, and I was like, Ooh. oh, so it was uh, unlike my other projects, which were really kind of focused more on on kind of alignment to specific outcomes, as you do kind of in educational circles like this was really very much a oh i'm just going to tell a story about um a sustainable development goal which has this education empathy and whatnot attached to it but i didn't really we didn't build it kind of with that school focus in mind and it was really much more designed for a, a kind of a general audience so we're working yeah to maybe see, thinking this kind of has a better fit in an aquarium or even just on a on the something that someone can download off um the um meta store or whatever um so that we're working currently we're in testing right now so we're working with some some people who we know who are who are very familiar with this and this kind of thing and can tell us what we need to fix um uh, and then we'll move it into beta testing where we get a bigger range of people. Cause obviously we, it is hard. Cause I mean, I, I spend a lot of my time in a VR headset and my um, it's really critical that you help people feel comfortable within the technology of the headset. Bef so they feel comfortable enjoying and immersing themselves in the narrative. So like understanding how that, works with a range of people range of ages range of um, interest level that's kind of where we're at right now and then working to kind of hopefully get this deployed in in um, aquaria kind of we're, we're talking as well with some um uh, tourism uh, entities and and things to kind of come who will have a focus on more ecotourism to kind of have that that um deeper experience um and yeah, so we're trying to figure that out because it all kind of came from nowhere um, that we're through this experience. And then, but we've had so much fun, the three otters, that we're going to go and do it again. Um, and we're heading to, as we, as you said, we're heading to Antarctica in February on a citizen science expedition um, to mark the 150th anniversary of the um, sailing of the HMS Discovery, which was kind of, which was, um, well, monumental in terms of ocean science research um and and kind of see what stories we can tell from there i think our focus is going to be a little bit more on the site on on how on what science is done down there and and how it's done um with a soupçon of the uh the um interspecies embodiment that has really captured us um uh, but our hope is like we're really we're just learning as we as we go with this and um trying to do the best that we can um and hoping that we can have a, a little a little impact but we so far the people who have played it it's it's really hitting the emotional notes that we were looking for i think it's stimulating the conversations that we were hoping that it would stimulate um and um right now that's all that we can we can ask for yeah, I need to connect you to Cassandra Brooks, who's on a previous show, and you guys need to share what your different projects. Uh, Tiff, you unmuted and then re-muted. Uh, Did you want to add a, a comment before Punya asks? Is, it might be the last question from Punya. I, I have a short question after it, but yeah. No, actually, Lou covered it, so we're fine. Thank you. Okay, so Punya. So, yeah, thanks. Um, I was just curious about... Um, one thing that you mentioned, which you know often gets talked about when people talk to, talk about VR, so this is a twofold question. So one is this, this sort of motion sickness or sort of that nausea and stuff like that. Have you 
Have you had some experience with that? I mean, do, does it work for all users or are there certain people for whom this technology is just a bridge too far? So that's one question. And the second is, um, what do you think of this, uh, you know, the um, what's next in the horizon in this space? I was sort of curious to hear what you think about sort of the Apple Vision Pro and stuff like that that's, that's coming out, which to me, you know, I'm not a big VR person. So this, you know, as opposed to, let's say, um, Chris, um, but that to me seemed like an interesting dimension of thinking about computation itself that way and maybe a good way for people to enter into that space. So I'll just be curious to hear your thoughts about both of these things. Sure. Remind me of the first bit again, quickly. Uh, the whole motion sickness. Yeah, you know, okay, yeah. So, and all of that, right? yeah, so I think um, motion sickness is definitely a problem with some people. Interestingly, I get super motion sick in a car and any kind of physical, like, and boats as well, but I don't experience it so much in the headset. So it can't, the, there's not so much correlation, but there are design principles that you can apply to minimize to mitigate that. Um, for example, like for me, I had to, in in some sense, sometimes in, in our game, like there's rotation motion and I had to slow that right down because that was starting to even make me feel peculiar. So it is something that you really, you do have to be mindful, but you can design for. One of the, but accessibility in general is something that is a huge element that we're still working through. So for example, most of the headsets right now, they will claim to, but do not do a very good job of dealing with people who wear corrective lenses. So I'm doing another project with an organization, a local organization on anti-bias training and um, with a, an organization that's, you know, this is big, like inclusivity is big. And I, when we were doing a demo, I'd say, if you wear glasses, you can't use this headset. Right. Like, so that's really that's really problematic. And there's lots of other things in terms of how menu design and things kind of work for different people. So I I think that at some point it will become it is becoming increasingly inclusive, but there are issues. I mean, it's not comfortable to be in this headset for for the for extended periods of time, despite what people think about this perpetual metaverse. Right. Like right now, it's not it's 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 not it um but that kind of lends itself like kind of into your your next question i mean it really i mean i i definitely speak from the perspective of someone who has fallen in love specifically with virtual reality so that kind of sits on a continuum between virtual reality and augmented reality so one being you are fully immersed in a totally different world and then the other being the other augmented reality being you are overprinting information, additional stuff on your vision of the of the the physical world. I, I, I learned alternatives, digital, digital, virtual and like physical worlds versus like this real and unreal because they're probably all real. Um, but um, so I've really focused on this fully in immersive stick yourself i am i am no longer even aware of what's going on in the physical world but what the new technology does and is really gone is really really jumping really far ahead is these is that other side of that continuum that mixed mixed to augmented reality where you are interspersing the digital and the real like i mean even the, the new meta quest headset the the what they call pass through so that the cameras which mean that you can see your actual surroundings as well the quality of that has just like jumped so far and that's really something that the apple device is really technologically speaking is really going to revolutionize that ability to combine the the physical and and digital worlds into something that is very cohesive um and then the big problem after that is this comfort thing where you are actually it is actually a pleasant experience to be inside that inside like to wear that for yeah. long periods of time um for me personally like because of the places I want, the experiences I'm looking at designing, like I'm really, that transportation to a totally new place is of primary primary interest to me personally from my design perspective. But at the same time, 
suddenly this new technological advanced in the mixed reality there are things that I'm ex- really excited about what people are going to do with that like it's in I mean I live in the mountains right like and this is a silly little example but from a safety perspective to be able to like see um, climbing routes or avalanche paths when you are actually physically sat in front of your route, like Mm -hmm. huge, like you're doing power, you're a power linesman and it can like project onto you kind of the things you need to like all of this stuff, like is hugely exciting, not necessarily the things I might build, but I'm really excited for what is going to happen in that space for sure. And Um, Apple getting in the, in the world, it's going to go so yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the first one that I saw where I felt like, okay, this might be one that I might actually try to get my hands on. Um, so, anyway, there's a question from so, a so, listener. So, I don't know if we have time for it. We only have a minute left here today. I wonder if Tiffany wants to go back and answer the, the previous question. Um, well, to be very minute. sure, to be very honest, like um, the whole world of VR is new for me. I'm um, the last video game I played before ours was duck hunt so it's a really really new world for me so literally everything is amazing and i i can't like i look at lou and i can't believe she built what we have in front of us so easy answer so before we close how do people contact you uh, and where do you where are you uh, are you in or what continents are you're in uh, canada louise in, in alberta i imagine and and, and um I am in the States and I float between California and the Florida Keys. So I guess people can get you through LinkedIn maybe or something like that, right? Yeah. So LinkedIn, um, they can um, email us at info at foundinthefjords.org. They want, um, no, sorry, hello at foundinthefjords. That was a big error on my part. But honestly, LinkedIn is probably the easiest. There's a whole bunch of links on the on the silver linings uh, for learning a uh, blog post for this um, episode that has how to contact us either individually or as a team through our social media. And we'd love to hear from anybody who has, you know, comments, questions, recommendations um, for what we can do next and how to make what we do better. Wonderful. And this has been a great show. We've been really engaged and all the people listening to this episode down the road will be engaged as well and probably contacting you. So I want to definitely thank you. Um, Punya or Chris, you want any last comments? Well, it was a great show. And next week, <clears throat> it's Host Reflect at noon on the 18th. Mm-hmm.